I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. Wilt Chamberlain's size, strength, and athleticism were unimaginable. He made large men appear small. And when he played, it seemed all too easy, almost unfair. His numbers were too big for comfort. He didn't just break records, he destroyed them. Basketball was Wilt Chamberlain's sandbox. I once performed in that arena, it's in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And all I could think about in the locker room was this was the locker room that, that Wilt was in when he scored 100 points. How could somebody score a hundred points in a game? This is the big fourth quarter, and everybody's thinking how many's Wolf got to get. He's got 69 gone in. Here's the pass to him. He's got another one. In the second half, the team decided that maybe they can get a hundred, so they were feeding him constantly. Chamberlain has 75 with 10 minutes to go. I don't think any of us realized that Wilt was on that much of a tear. Then Dave Zinkoff announced that for 82 points, and literally. Wilt's eyes lit up. Knickerbocker's just starting for time. He has 94, two minutes and five seconds to play. New York was freezing the ball. And had you just walked into the game and not realized what was going on, you'd say, here, here's a team they're losing by 15 points and they're freezing the ball. They wanted to use time so Wilt couldn't score. In fact, it got so ridiculous at, at one stretch where they were deliberately fouling us when we got the ball in bounds to keep the clock from running. I was embarrassed, you know, basically playing in a game like that. One minute and one second to play. Chamberlain at 98. He can make it easily. We were going for 100. His record was our record. In the There must have been 46 or 47 seconds remaining in the game. People just ran out of the stand just to touch Will, just to be there. Before 4,000 mesmerized fans on March 2nd, 1962, Will Chamberlain played in the clouds, draining 36 field goals and collecting 28 points from the line. The 7-1 center lifted his game beyond reach of any NBA player in history. He was so dominant uh, and so impossible to stop, Wilt was bound to score 100 points, whether it was going to be that season or some other season in the future. Chamberlain, slam dunk. We used to watch Wilt Chamberlain every single Sunday. <laughs> the Big Depper. I think probably Wilt dominated the game more than anyone else. And the reason I say that because Wilt could do it on both ends of the floor. Offensively, no one could guard him. And defensively, Wilt was going after every shot. Russell, blocked by Chamberlain, a great block by Chamberlain. I learned a lesson early against Wilt when I was a rookie. I blocked one of his shots, and he blocked every shot that I took the next five times we played them. Lenny Wilkins cast off a shot that appeared to be three feet above the basket. And Wilt jumped up and caught this ball with one hand. The referee called goaltending. And I hollered at him, how could you call that goaltending? And he says, guy, what I just saw is not humanly possible. You really can't tell how big he is until you actually see him. I mean, he shook my hand and my hand disappeared. And, and I'm just going, I don't believe this. People don't understand how big he is. He like blocks out the sun. The sense of size in Will Chamberlain is, is the essence of the man. It's just there. You just feel like you're in the presence of some giant. Will was simply, uh, you know, a man child in a game where it was just simple. Well, he got 55 rebounds in a game. Will averaged 50 points a game for a full season. 50 points a game. Will Chamberlain played 80 games one year and averaged over 48 minutes a game. He never fouled out of a professional basketball game in his entire career. In 1959, Chamberlain hit the NBA with full force. He was the first player named Rookie of the Year and MVP in the same season. The reaction to his size and talent was so unsettling that the rules of the game suddenly seemed inadequate. I think in the long run, I'll be able to handle myself man to man with almost anyone in the league. He was the only guy that could change the landscape in basketball, change the rules. Offensive goaltending, defensive goaltending. He had to widen the lane. 
the free throw shooter had to release the ball behind the line. Wilt could take off from the free throw line and dunk the foul shot. When Wilt came into the league in the late 50s, oh, I think absolutely there was, there was fear. He's a black man, and he's dominating what had been basically a white sport. Wilt just forged right through those things. Wilt Chamberlain always judged everyone as an individual. I was extremely impressed with his demeanor. He never got flustered, he never got mad. Wilt was a nice guy, uh, sometimes to his detriment on the court. He was too nice a man. I can't tell you how many times I watched him go up for a dunk and someone would put their hand within the cylinder trying to block a shot and Wilt would let up because he knew he could break the man's arm. Chamberlain won seven straight scoring titles, 11 rebounding crowns, and two championship rings. Yet, for most of his 14 seasons, he played in a shadow of perfection cast by the press. He had a lot of terrible things said about him uh, uh, because he didn't win more. Wilt Chamberlain will forever be defined were his failures, not his victories. It's his own fault. He had opportunities to change it, and he could never do it. Chamberlain was concerned about Chamberlain. He was in love with his stats. I think showing his peers that he could score 50 a game, that he could get 24 rebounds, that he could get eight assists, I think that was enough for Wilt to say, look, they're, they're the numbers. He was so great that no matter what he did, people never accepted it as being enough. If you look at his records and the records that he set, I always thought it was like watching him in slow motion. I thought he could have even done more. If you win, everybody says, well, look at him, he's that big. If you lose, it's, how can he lose a guy that size? I think it's confused him. He would have been better in an individual sport. He'd have been much better just competing for himself. Are you blowing your summer waiting for the fun to start? Then... And that works. It's not easy growing up, seven feet tall, gifted, black in American society. But Wilt Chamberlain was just Wilt the Stilt. You know, I mean, they, they, they never saw the total human being. Born in Philadelphia on August 21st, 1936, Wilton Norman Chamberlain suffered the emotional inequities generated by his rapid growth. He sucked his thumb, no matter what he was doing. Now, don't forget, we came out of elementary school he was six foot three. He was still sucking that thumb. He not only was tall and thought of as unusual, he stuttered. He was always slouching uh, over because he was not very proud. It was a terrible, terrible thing to be tall because people would pick at you. The family called him Dip because he had to dip through the door. <laughs> people had never seen anyone as tall as Wilt. Some looked at him in amazement, some were befuddled, being 6'10", 6'11", at 13 years old, 14 years old. It really created a, a, a real barrier for him. One of nine children, Wilt found solace and guidance within the nurturing atmosphere of his home. His mother, he really respected. She was the rock around him. His father was a laborer and worked hard. And that rubbed off on Wilt. It was a great family atmosphere, and Wilt was not treated any different than anybody else in the family. He was tall, but you could still take out the trash. He still had to do his chores. Scraping door frames at Overbrook High School, Chamberlain's career 37-point average overheated the imaginations of college recruiters across the country as he led the Panthers to consecutive city championships. No one had seen anybody with this agility. No one had seen anybody go up in the air and catch the ball at its apex and just bring it down. That was frightening. It was a time when we had 120 scholarships being offered to him. He was being called day and night. One school said, we're going to put you in the movies and make you a celebrity. Another school said, we'll give your brothers and sisters scholarships to colleges. Eddie Gottlieb, who was the owner of the Philadelphia Warriors, got a rule put in that you could draft a player out of high school 
for delivery four years later. He went to Kansas to play, already belonging to Philadelphia upon graduation. Will Chamberlain's reputation coming out of high school was that he was so big and so overwhelming that uh, uh, nobody could ever deal with him on a basketball court. If he had been perceived as unstoppable on the hardwood, Chamberlain would also challenge the values of middle American society. In the fall of 1955, an unforgettable sighting occurred at KU's Lawrence campus. A big black man coming to Kansas in the early 50s or the mid 50s, it was a culture shock for a lot of people, no question about it. I think for him it was a little bit of a wake-up call to realize that most of America was not Philadelphia, was not West Philadelphia, and that it was overwhelmingly white and he was going to be treated as an oddity. And the first time he went to a public restaurant, he was denied. They told him they didn't serve blacks. The color line was broken because Wilt went in, sat down, ordered a meal, and was served. And from that point on, there was no problem. After being ordained a campus cult figure, Chamberlain hosted a late-night radio show called Flippin' with the Dipper. When he wasn't spinning 45s on the air, Wilt found refuge in the brotherhood of sports. And it wasn't always basketball. He went to Bill Easton, the track coach, one time and said, Coach, I'd like to enter in the high jump. And Bill said, well, Wilt, he said, you, you haven't even practiced. He said, how could you possibly compete? And he said, well, just give me a chance. Wilt won the Big Seven High Jump Championship with no practice at all. I saw Wilt Chamberlain run under two minutes in the 880 yards. I saw him put the shot over 50 feet. In the 1950s, big guys were still called goons. There was a sense that they weren't athletes, that they were only in the game because they were tall. There was this natural disposition to see this guy simply as a freak of nature. And no matter what he did on the track and field, didn't change that image. However he may have been perceived, Chamberlain's impact on college basketball proved deep and permanent. When he came to Kansas, the rumor got out and scared the daylights out of everybody in the country. They said he could stand at the free throw line and just leap and stuff, which under the old rules would have been legal. We would play a team like Oklahoma State and uh, they might pass the ball 40, 45 times before they'd uh, attempt a shot, realizing that uh, any time you ran with the team that Wilt was on, that you're probably going to get blown out pretty good. In his first varsity season, Wilt averaged 30 points and 19 rebounds, leading Kansas into the 1957 NCAA Final. Anchored by the big center, who KU's former coach Fogg Allen once whimsically remarked could win the national title with two cheerleaders and two Phi Beta Kappas, the Jayhawks were seven-point favorites over top-ranked North Carolina. Kansas had a, a forward named Maurice King, who was a very good shooter. Well, of course, North Carolina surrounded Wilt, surrounded him all the time, which left King open, and, and King could not make a basket. Simply couldn't get the ball down. Despite Chamberlain's 23 points and 14 rebounds, the Jayhawks trailed 54-53 in the closing seconds of the most famous triple overtime game in college history. They're going to pass into Ronnie Lineski, who's going to try to lob the ball high and get it into Wilt, who can score. But it was intercepted by North Carolina, and the ball game ended, and the Jayhawks come up one point short, three overtimes. Chamberlain carried the loss as though it were his alone. That he just thought that he'd let the University of Kansas down. None of us felt that he'd let us down. We were just glad to, to be riding on his coattails, and he took us as far as he possibly could. What happens? Team beats individual and Chamberlain was marked from that moment on people would hark back to that and say he can't win in the weeks following the 1957 NCAA title game lost to North Carolina Will Chamberlain seriously weighed whether he should remain at Kansas he decided to stay and despite an injury in December, averaged over 30 points and 17 rebounds as a junior for the 18-5 Jayhawks. But after the team failed to make the NCAA tournament, he confided to a friend that he might leave. He said, Sonny, if I stay in college, they're going to put three and four people around me, and I'm not going to be able to expand my game. Chamberlain decided to leave. But with the NBA closed to him until his Kansas class graduated, he signed a one-year contract with Abe Saperstein's Harlem Globetrotters for $60,000, twice what any NBA basketball player was making at the time. 
he learned some things how to relax and have some fun with the game that I don't think he experienced before. He wanted Wilt more than one year. He wanted to go play basketball. A clown he wasn't. After joining the Philadelphia Warriors upon his NBA eligibility in 1959, Chamberlain immediately asserted his dominance, averaging 38 points and 27 rebounds. As a rookie, he had climbed to the top of the league, where only one other center stood. He could not be guarded, he could not be defended, he could not be thwarted. He was the greatest physical specimen that anybody has ever seen on a basketball court, and one guy had his number. One guy was David to his Goliath. One guy, Bill Russell. Probably the greatest matchup in the history of basketball. It really took on biblical proportions in a way. It was like good against evil, offense against defense. Everybody thought Bill is the nice guy. And here comes this big giant from Philadelphia and he's the bad guy. He was the monster. He was this, this, this behemoth. He was not Jack the Giant Killer. He was the giant that we all wanted to kill. And this guy was five or six inches bigger than Russell, was 70 pounds, heavier than Russell, was very skillful at what he did. The first time we played Wilt, Wilt destroyed Bill Russell put enough fear in Bill Russell's heart that Russell was going to do anything to beat Wilt. The only difference between the two of them was the fire in the belly. If he had one third of, of Russell's intensity, God, he would have been even more awesome than he was. Anything more awesome was almost inconceivable. Never averaging below 33 points and 22 rebounds a season between 1960 and 1966, Chamberlain reached his offensive zenith by scoring 50 points a game in 1962. But in those seven years, Chamberlain fell to Russell in five playoffs. When the Celtics would come to town, a lot of people don't realize that Wilt would invite Russell to his house for dinner. And then they'd go to the arena and Russell would try to tear his head off. Russell was a master of psychology. He knew exactly what he was doing all the time, you know, and he used that. Russell would let Wilt score. Wilt's teammates would stand there and watch Wilt score. They'd never be involved. And then he'd shut Wilt down, and now this time the other guys are cold. I've seen Wilt get down on the floor and beat his hands on the floor, hands and knees, he was so frustrated. I guess to be very honest with you, Boston probably had a better team than we did. You know, there's always talk of Wilt versus Russell and Russell beat Wilt, etc. That's not true. Russell didn't beat Wilt. Boston beat Philly. In 1962, the Warriors moved to San Francisco, where for the next two and a half seasons, Chamberlain stayed atop the scoring and rebounding charts. Meanwhile, the Syracuse Nationals moved to Philadelphia and were renamed the 76ers. In January of 1965, Wilt would resume his on-again, off-again relationship with the city of brotherly love. When the trade was made to bring him back to Philadelphia from San Francisco, I mean, the media just went crazy. I mean, he was like, for a couple of weeks, it was the number one front page story in the city. So are you happy or sad about it? <laughs> mixed, mixed emotions. Actually, I'll be like Tony Bennett leaving my heart here in San Francisco because I fell in love with the city. In 1966, the 76ers head coach, Alex Hannum, convinced the 30-year-old Chamberlain that in order to win an NBA title, he would have to rebuild his game from the ground up. Never in the history of sport has a player of Wilt's magnitude been asked to change what he has done so well for so many years for the betterment of the team. Wilt just looked around and saw the talent on that team and realized that these players would perform better the more they were involved in the play rather than Wilt doing everything. He was assisting more, he was rebounding more, he was playing better defense, the whole bit. He beats Russell fair and square one time when it mattered in 1967 when he had his finest year, the most balanced year a man could have, 24 points a game, 24 rebounds a game, and eight assists a game for a team that wins 68 games. He, they blow out the Celtics in five games. Ah! 
Well, the Celtics are the brink of defeat for the first time since 1956. Game they try, but they did not have it here in the second half. We go in the locker room and there's champagne's out and everybody's so excited. Chamberlain didn't want any champagne. He said, we have one more step to go. And then the champagne was put down and we understood that we'll drink it, you know, in another 10 days. We felt that beating Boston was tantamount to winning the championship. Of course, we had to beat uh, San Francisco first to, to get the world's title. Which the 76ers did in six games. Although Wilt's revamp game brought Philadelphia its first NBA title, the future, which might have held a dynasty, would be flawed by the great center's bete noir, the foul shot. of course we get to the fact that he couldn't sink free throws he loved to say that he could sink shots from outside as well as Jerry West or Gail Goodrich or somebody he was playing which was perfect nonsense but that was important for him because you see that wasn't a function of size but then you'd ask him well if that's true well why can't you shoot a free throw and he didn't have an answer the germ of Wilt Chamberlain's foul line affliction had been planted back in Kansas a 62% free throw shooter with the Jayhawks, Wilt, by 1968, was missing more than six of 10 from the strike. I mean, he tried underhand, sideways, you know, almost back to the top of the circle, and just never could do that. But yet in practice, he could sit there and make seven out of 10. I think if Wilt really concentrated on it, and he had a little help from somebody who could shoot fouls and, and instruct him like a golf pro, he could have been a better shooter. One game, Earl Strom, the great referee, was working the game, and Wilt got a, a foul called on him. He's on the way to the line, and he turns, and then the most... If you can imagine a seven-foot, three-incher speaking in a pitiable voice, he said, Earl, Earl, tell me, help me, why can't I make a free throw? Against the Celtics in the 1968 Eastern Division Finals, the 76ers blew a three games to one lead. In their four point loss in game seven, Chamberlain was less than dominant, shooting four for nine from the field and six of 15 from the foul line. It was his last game as a 76er. Wilt has always said that he had been promised a piece of ownership of the team. And if he was not going to get it, he wanted to be traded. He said, I want to be traded, and I want to be traded to a West Coast team. And uh, we got Darrell Imhoff and Archie Clark and Jerry Chambers for Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt went to the Lakers. And he's sitting there at the press conference, and one of the reporters asks Wilt, does he think Butch Von Bredikoff, who's the coach of the Lakers, will be able to control him? And Wilt looks at the reporter and said, no one controls Wilt. Then in the first day of practice, we moved the ball around and he's moving a little bit and guys are cutting. I said, holy mackerel, this, I mean, these guys look good. Second day, you couldn't get him out of one spot in the court. It was a terrible, he just stood there. Van Bredikoff referred to Wilt as a big load and Wilt referred to Van Bredikoff as the dumbest coach he had ever played for. That was understood and that polarized that particular team. Despite such mutual dislike, the Lakers took the Celtics into the seventh game of the 1969 finals. Trailing by seven points, Chamberlain took himself out with 519 left in the fourth quarter. Wilt's knee was really paining him. And he just wanted to quiet it down for a couple of minutes. And he came out and he put some ice on it. So when the knee quieted down a little bit, Dipper said to me, tell the man I'm ready to go back in. And Van Brennikoff said, tell him to hell with him. We don't need him. If I remember correctly the words I said, and I've said them often enough, so we're playing better without you. Coach Van Bredikoff and Wilt did not get along at all. I think Van Bredikoff would have been thrilled to win a championship with Wilt sitting on the bench. But the Lakers lost 108-106. And in the aftermath, Chamberlain suffered a blow that would hurt long after his knee recovered. Compliments of his chief adversary who had played his last game. Russell called him a faker, that he wouldn't stay in uh, during the game. 
Russell gave him a little needle after that. You should have played as a seventh game. Russell couldn't understand it, but in that moment, you, uh, when all is on the line, you wouldn't go back in the game. You know, it was a foreign idea to him. Whatever criticism he received was unfair. Um, he, he was hurting, and I know he was hurting. He wasn't one of those players that would ever take himself over. He hated to come out again. With Russell gone in 1970, the path to the NBA title was rerouted through Madison Square Garden. When Knicks center Willis Reed went down with a knee injury in Game 5, the way to glory seemed open for Wilt and his talented supporting cast. They somehow rallied together in the fifth game with no one on the floor taller than 6-7 in the second half and beat the Lakers to go up 3-2. Take themselves back to Los Angeles. Wilt asserts himself with 45 points and 27 rebounds against hapless Nate Bowman, taking us all back to New York with everyone wondering, can Willis play or can't Willis play? A couple of Knicks come out, they begin to shoot. A couple of more come out, and I'm watching Wilt, and he keeps looking at the guys that came out. He's looking for Willis Reed, and suddenly there is this incredible roar and here comes Willis, and the crowd is going wild. I saw West, I saw Chamberlain, I saw Baylor stopping their tracks because the both teams were warming up, and they were just staring at Reed. And I said to myself at that point, man, I think we got these guys. Frazier then slows it down, is picked up by Jerry West at the top of the post, Reed. In the end, Willis Reed's two baskets in 27 minutes counted more than Chamberlain's 21 points and 24 rebounds as the Lakers went down 113-99. What Russell says is, if I had been playing Willis Reed, I would have gone right at it. I would have never played harder in my whole life. I would have asked for the ball every time down. I would have put it to him. I, if he tried to shoot, I'd have been right in his face and knocked it down. And Wilt was sort of intimidated. Wilt didn't want to be the bad guy. He knew the whole world was cheering for Willis Reed. He may not have had the killer instinct at certain moments to go after somebody's knees, to go after somebody's weakness. Dispirited by his failure to reach the top, Chamberlain decided to quit the NBA and looked elsewhere for victory, professional boxing. Customato told Wilt that if he trained, he couldn't make a career out of fighting. But if he trained for one fight, specifically for Ali, that he had a chance to succeed. Angelo Dundee said to Muhammad, you can't do this. And Muhammad says, why not? He can't fight. And Angelo stood up on a chair, little guy, and made himself seven foot one and a sixteenth of an inch and said, try to hit me. We call this massive press conference at the Astrodome. Prediction? No. One prediction. Will Chamberlain went to the next room, asked permission to use the telephone, called a person whom I believe to be Jack Ken Cook, came out and said, look guys, I decided that I'm going to continue to play basketball. I don't want to fight. At the beginning of the 1972 season, Lakers coach Bill Sharman proposed a different role for Chamberlain. He pulled Will aside, suggested very calmly that he play like Russell, play defensively, block shots, not try to be a I scored, and Will thought about it, and he did it. Content to average just 15 points, Will led the league in rebounds at 19 a game. The Lakers soared, mounting a record 33-game winning streak and finishing with 69 victories. Beating the Knicks in five games, they won their first NBA title since moving to Los Angeles in 1960. He's met every challenge. He's crossed every bridge. The Los Angeles Lakers are the world champions of basketball. After losing to the Knicks in the 1973 finals, Will Chamberlain, although contractually bound as a player to the Lakers, jumped to the ABA as head coach of the San Diego Conquistadors. The word that comes to my mind is a publicity stunt. I don't think he did a great deal of the co actual coaching of the team. I do remember that Wilt would come into the games about 15 minutes before the game was, would start. A lot of times there wasn't even uh, a team meeting with him involved anyway because he wouldn't come to the arena until the team was already out on the floor. Chamberlain quit coaching after just one season to pursue new worlds, many of which demanded talents that had lain fallow during his years as Wilt the Still. If Will Chamberlain didn't play basketball, he would have been a great success in something else. He would have gone to Wharton School of Business. 
he just found basketball was his vehicle to have the lifestyle that he enjoys. He had some business people early in his career that invested well for him. He understood money. He brought a nightclub up in Harlem called the Big Boat Smalls Paradise. It was an all-black club and great music and jam-packed every night. He owned racehorses. He owned real estate. He invested in uh, the stock market. His home was constructed for a man 7'2". And he takes me in the bedroom and he said, watch this. And he pressed the button next to the bed and the roof went back. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. We're in New York uh, to play the Knicks and he asked me up to a suite. But I wasn't there two or three minutes and here comes room service with four entrees. Gee, gee, well, uh, I've already eaten. No, 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 my man. These are all for me. Although many and varied, Chamberlain's appetites led him in directions other than the front lines of the civil rights movement. Will Chamberlain did not take any overt, active role in the politics of the African-American community or in terms of race and ethnic relations issues. He lived in a different world. I really enjoyed that. Wilt never brought up racism. Then, of course, you know, he, he supported Nixon. Figure that one out. <laughs> the only plan that uh, I had is uh, trying to help make uh, Richard Nixon the next president of the United States of America. He got a lot of flack from the black community because they were not really in Nixon corner at that time. And when Wilk came out for Nixon, it was like, you know, what is he doing? When you have someone like Will Chamber uh, supporting uh, the opposition, uh, it becomes sort of distressful, somewhat disappointing. In order for, I believe, uh, the black man to get the most out of his vote, that he should, uh, you know, try to infiltrate the Republican Party as much as possible. He felt that his impact would be to let you know that blacks are just as smart and intelligent as anybody else. He was one of the most phenomenal athletes that this nation is ever likely, or any nation is ever likely to see. But beyond the court, he drops off the chart in terms of his relevance and maybe being the great athlete that he was is enough hey guys listen up you want volleyball became his passion and he thought he could make the olympic team as a volleyball player he got involved in volleyball a couple of years before he retired, about three years before he retired, and just said, that's it. I think I can build volleyball. And he became the international volleyball president, got beach volleyball off the ground. Supporting women's track and such charities as Operation Smile, Will Chamberlain stayed in the public eye. Somebody wanted to do a commercial which talked about bigness. Who did you go to get? You didn't go to get Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You didn't go get Bill Wall. You got Will Chamberlain to show that he could get into a Volkswagen or whatever it was. But then why are you driving a rat? Because it has more hair than my Rolls Royce. Will was pretty selective in what products he endorsed. The best commercial he ever did was standing back to back with Willie Shoemaker for a credit card. It was a wonderful image. He perhaps wanted to prove that a seven-foot guy who was seen just as a basketball player was more than able to do a lot of other things. Maybe that's why he did movies. He was just an incredible physical specimen. And then I remember seeing him at a Lakers playoff game in the mid-80s. And he had a black tank top on. What a specimen. I mean, he looked like a municipal statue. While Wilt seemed to stay young, an old foe was closing in on a record that had seemed unreachable when he retired. In 1984, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar eclipsed Chamberlain's mark to become the NBA's all-time leading scorer. It renewed the divide in the off-and-on relationship that began in the 1960s, when Kareem, then Lou Alcindor, was a teenager. 
And they were very tight. He took him to the finest restaurants just to get him used to what life is really going to be. He would lend me some of his uh, jazz albums. A couple of times I went by his apartment on Central Park West and uh, returned his albums. I've known Kareem since 1965. Lou always had really admired Wilt, and Wilt gave Lou a hard time because he was the heir to the throne. When you're an athlete and you're finished, and then you begin to recede in time in other people's minds, not yours. And so the headlines in the papers no longer say Wilt. Now they say Jabbar. History hasn't been that kind to Wilt, even though he set all sorts of records that took Kareem forever to break. Wilt resented that as well. He didn't think Kareem was the all-around player, and he let people know. What did he do that was better than you? In the facets of, of, of the game, you yeah. mean, did he score better than I did? Did he rebound better than I did? Did he pass better than I did? Did he run better than I did? Did he, you know, it's hard for me to figure out. If Chamberlain's scoring record was overtaken by Abdul-Jabbar, Wilt went one better. In his 1991 book, A View From Above, the lifelong bachelor claims statistical superiority in another activity. I said, there is no way in hell you could have slept with 20,000 women, I said, because there were too many nights that I saw you going back to your room with only a bag of McDonald's. Anybody who thinks that numbers don't mean anything to Will Chamberlain, all he had to do was to read that book. Somehow, I think that he felt that validated him. He got a call from a woman who clearly wanted to come up and see him. He said, well, I got a meeting going on here right now. Uh, I can't make it, and, you know, besides I've had you. Um, if you've got a girlfriend, um, we'll talk about it. Did Wilt know a lot of women? Of course he did. Bachelor, living in L.A., being a star. The publisher said, you know, we need to do something to really have this book jump out. After all was said and done, he was embarrassed that he allowed that to come out. Wilt's defense of that is to say that it's harder to make love to the same woman a thousand times as to make love once to a thousand different women. That's part of that same page in his book. People ignored that to just zero in on the 20,000. This revelation came along at a time when promiscuity was suddenly not the coolest thing to admit to because Magic Johnson had just been diagnosed. And at the same time, you thought, you know what? If a woman admitted to that, she'd be called a slut. He didn't want to be tied down to one relationship. He knew he wanted to travel. He wanted a freer life. And he lived the life he wanted to do. My theory is that there are four really important numbers in Will Chamberlain's life. Zero for the number of times he fouled out. 50 for the number of points he averaged during one full season. 100 for the number of points he scored in one single game. And 20,000 for the number that will never be forgotten. In January 1998, in his first official visit to the University of Kansas since leaving the school some four decades earlier, Wilt Chamberlain had his college number retired. He said that he had kind of always felt like maybe the KU people blamed him for losing the national championship game to North Carolina in 1957. And the response that he got that day, I think, eliminated any feeling of that in his mind I've learned over the years that you must learn to take the bitter with the sweet. And how sweet this is. And I'm now very much a part of it by being there and very proud of it. Rod Hawk, Jay Hawk. Plagued by heart problems for years, the Big Dipper, Will Chamberlain, succumbed in October of 1999. I know when I saw him Saturday, I knew that he would not live much longer. He looked that bad. That Tuesday, I got the call at 1 o'clock. And it's uh, with great sadness that we announce the death of Will Chamberlain. Yeah. Mr. Chamberlain was 63 years old. When I got the phone call that Wilt had died, I felt like I had been kicked in the stomach. I, I, not only did I didn't want to believe it, but I couldn't believe it. I thought Wilt was indestructible. It was like Superman dying. I said, no. It's impossible. Dippy was so big, 
We all thought he was going to live forever. More than 1,300 mourners attended memorial services in Philadelphia and Los Angeles. I'm unspeakably injured by what happened the last few days. Uh, this was an integral part of my life and a good friend. Lately, we used to call each other, and the message I would leave, Wilton Norman Chamberlain, this is William Felton Russell. He used to call me, and uh, when I was home, he'd say, Felton, this is Norman. I think the people who attended kind of appreciated the way the service was done because it depicted him uh, not so much as a basketball player, but as a human being. He was so busy doing. I'm not surprised he had a tired heart. He gave so much of it to us. The bulk of his estate, 90% or, or so, is going to be distributed to charities that would be in line with his beliefs. That's the way he always was. You know, when you come from an environment where children, you know, don't get, unless somebody gives them a start, it's easy to, to take your money and, and do that. He always resented being regarded as a freak, one-dimensional. Whether that one dimension is height, black, basketball, score, celebrity. There's a side that bothers me that people don't know. It's a gentle man off the court, the caring man. I would never have wanted to be Will Chamberlain. There was no place to hide. Every few years, Wilt Chamberlain would suggest in interviews that he could still play in the NBA. The New Jersey Nets offered him about $360,000 for the final few games of the 86 season. Chamberlain had been retired for 13 years. And here was someone else agreeing with him that, yes, Wilt still had game. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.